The Monerotopia Price Report segment is sponsored by Local Monero. Avoid using KYC exchanges. Buy and sell Monero directly for fiat, peer-to-peer. Hello, hello, buddy. How do you do? Hey, guys. Doing great. Hey, buddy. Thank you for joining hello. Friday. Yeah, sorry. We had to switch it up. No, it's fine. Sounds like you guys are going to have a good time at the Libertarian Conference. Hopefully, yeah. you spread the word of Monero. Should be very cool. He's going to give me time to give a little talk, and then I think we're going to do some kind of round table. Should be good. Do the Libertarian, like the official Libertarian Party people, are they interested in Monero, or are they like just generically yay cryptocurrency? Yeah, no, they're interested in Monero. So there's the the Mises Caucus took over the party. Um, we were there when it happened, actually, at the National Libertarian Convention. Nice. Which was very cool. And we, you know, we were speaking to people there and they were expressing interest in Monero. And so they're, yeah, they're, they're very open to it. You know, they're, they're crypto, I guess, agnostic. Obviously, they're big Bitcoiners. Um, but the Mises party itself is very pro crypto. And so they, they're, they're not just like, they, they know crypto, right? So they've, they've found their way to Monero. I'll put it that way. You know, they, they cool. respect Monero. They're trying to add it as a way to donate, I believe. But I don't know. They're having issues with that for some reason. Um, but, yeah, they're, they're all about it. That's why they're, they've reached out to us as to come talk about it. I think they're just trying to get the word out more now, which is very cool. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, I remember um, I went to the, um, to the Texas State Republican Convention in 2012 to try and elect Ron Paul. But our local convention, our county convention in Austin, um, this thing ended in a parking garage because uh, we were at some church and we lost, like, we, we, they only had so long to do the convention. And they knew it was going to be contentious because they knew there was a bunch of Ron Paul people there. But so they didn't book it for long enough. And then, you know, they had church the next day. So we like, we all voted to go finish this thing in the parking garage next door. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds about right. That sounds like the Libertarian <laughs> Party. Yeah, this is this the Republican Party, but probably all parties, I guess. Oh, this is the Republican Party? Yeah, this is 2012. Oh, oh, okay, okay. Travis County Convention. Oh, very cool. (laughs) That's awesome. Um, I actually have a video somewhere on YouTube where I I recorded the whole thing on a tablet, and I uploaded it on some old YouTube account that I have. It's it's not really that interesting, but, you know, just the the way that everything went down was like, it was very eye-opening. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah, tomorrow's is going to be in a fire department. You know, it's uh, it should be yeah, it should be cool. It's going to be a nice group. Cool. Yeah, it sounds like fun. Probably the Libertarian Party is a little bit more fun than the Republican Party. I have to imagine. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> definitely. The after parties are definitely better. What I'm most impressed by with the Libertarian Party is just the the, the focus on first principles, right? And uh, like so many people, like really study the philosophy behind all all these concepts right you know like i think your, your average republican at the republican convention if you stopped and had a like a try to have a deep convo with them about like where where their ideals are coming from i mean some some of them don't get me wrong but like the vast majority of the libertarian party are, are really like focused and zoomed zoned in on that and spend a lot of time on that which is very impressive and uh you know it's it's one of the reasons why i have a lot of like admiration for them that's good yeah do you think um i know there was like some kind of accusations or not accusations but like them saying that uh who was the guy that they elected uh elected to run for president um i think it was 2016 the guy that made in aleppo he didn't know what aleppo was and that like ended his campaign basically oh Um, yeah i don't know his name I know the last was name, Joe Jorgensen, was the last. The one before him. Okay. Yeah, I forget. I forget his name. Yeah. Anyways, but like, so you think that generally speaking, you know, like there's, it's not compromised or anything overall. It's like the people, at least the people on the ground are, are pretty, um, pretty consistent. Well, when you say compromise, what do you mean? Like, is there like a small cabal that's running the thing or something? Or what do you mean? No, like, so, for example, I really wish I could remember the guy's name, who it was, but um, that was also the race where John McAfee had, was, like, the number two guy in the Libertarian Party to get the nomination, and instead it was uh, it was the other guy. Um, well, now with the Mises group in charge, they, they, they seem pretty, uh, I don't know, like, res- 
pretty hardcore in their determination to to be very true to libertarian values. Although, I mean, you talk to some people in the park, like Martha Bueno, I think is isn't a big fan of them. Um, but that's just like internal politics. But yeah, to answer your question, I, I think yeah, no, I think they're, they're pretty they're pretty legit. They're they're uh, I don't know. They're maintaining themselves pretty well. I mean, we'll see how they do as they grow, right? It's kind of like crypto, right? You know, so <laughs> yeah, they're they're like Monero, right? They're a small project. Um, they're pretty much the community is is aligned. Uh, although I shouldn't say that, right? Because uh, it's different than other parties in that, given libertarian val values, it's like the they're kind of anti-establishment, right? And like they're. They, they, they don't want to be a necessarily a cohesive group at the end of the day, right? Because they want new yeah. ideas and new um, uh, groups to be able to evolve out of the party. So it's like there there are quite a few factions. Um, but yeah, no, I think I think I think it's a healthy, healthy party. I think it's going to blossom in the next couple of years. I think it's really going to take well, that's, off. That's cool. I, I didn't know that the Mises Institute had taken over, but uh, yeah, I mean. It's cool to see that there's some change there and yeah. maybe they'll put up another John McAfee, but that's impossible because mm. there's, there's no other John McAfee. Yeah. No, there's, there's no replacement for that guy. <laughs> but yeah, man, well, another big, big week, huh? I guess so. It, to me, it seemed pretty calm. There, there didn't seem to be too much, like I, nothing really caught my eyes being all that crazy. Um, well, it's a big week in terms of the broader markets, right? And like, what's just like, what's taking place. Yeah, we had the FOMC meeting. Um, Jay Powell got up and, uh, you know, told everyone what, what's what. Um, nothing really too crazy came out of that. It was a 25 basis point rate hike, which is kind of what we talked about last week. Um, they don't want to look totally ineffective, but um, neither <clears throat> neither do they want to, like, really give the market something to worry about. Um, and, of course, it was all the things that he said afterward that were really typically, in almost all cases, those are the more important things. Um so really what we, we didn't see anything too crazy from him. I said, oh, yeah, inflation, you know, is still a problem. And um, you know what? Let me go check. There was like two things those, that stuck those out of my meetings mind. Are, those meetings are so funny because it's like he gives he, he gives his little speech, right? And then the press just basically asks like the same question in like 20 different ways. <laughs> They're just like, so yeah. like, are you sure you're not going to like, are you going to raise it or lower it next time? Like, like that's all they want to know. So they try to ask it in 10 different ways. So like, that and like any hard questions that they really want to ask, they've got to <laughs> phrase it in a way that sounds very dry. So they, you know, get invited back the next time. Right. But his response <laughs> is always the same. It's like, well, uh, we'll look at the data. And, you know, it's the same response just said. In See, that's ways. that's where I think that um, there actually is quite a lot said there. And in fact, when you when you learn how to read between the lines, mm -hmm. um, like sometimes he'll say things and you're like, man, if he was talking just as a regular person and not to the whole nation or to the whole world, um, he would say something in maybe in an entirely different way. So, for example, um, back in maybe it was October, he was talking about, oh, labor conditions are tightening and, and this and that. And there's not enough uh, there's not enough labor mm -hmm. and there's not enough workers beyond statistically, you know, what we expect in our projections, blah, blah, blah. Sounds very dry. But the translation of that is. Too many of you have mad gains from all the money that we printed. So now we got to pull it back to force some of you out of retirement and go back to work, you millennials. It's <laughs> something like that. <laughs> I mean, I, yeah, I know I'm no, kind of embellishing there, but no, I get it. You know, you definitely there's things to gather when you when you when you listen to him closely. It's it's just really funny, right? I mean, that that just like sums up the fiat system. You got this like one guy that we're all trying to figure out, like. All right, one so, man. Yeah, what what is he gonna do next? <laughs> the <laughs> world waits. Right? Jesus. So the two big things that I took from this one is um, he said that they're done raising. Um, he didn't say the word pause. Uh, it was interesting how he used like two sentences to say pause, but um, basically that they're done raising. He said maybe that they've got another one or two if they feel that they need to. Um, and the other thing is that he believes the balance sheet expansion that we saw is temporary. So, for example, let's go. This is the total assets of the Federal Reserve. We looked at this last week and it bumped up here. Um, we saw this week that it bumped up by like another 100 billion or something. But these are by and large 90 day loans. So they should end up reversing. Um, so Jay Powell said that they believe that this balance sheet expansion is temporary. They also thought inflation was temporary. So 
<laughs> right? Who knows? Um, but an interesting consequence of raising 25 points was what it did to the um, what it did to the bond market, which I had pulled up, but where did it go? Uh, all right, I guess I have to find it again. Sorry about that. I guess no worries, no worries. Here we go. Okay, so this is the chart that matters. There's there's two things here actually. We'll talk about the yield curve inversion in, in a second, but um, so this step function right here that just happened that was the Fed raising 25 basis points, and this white line was where we were last week, and this was the rate that. Um, that people were, were borrowing from the Fed's discount window. And by window, we don't mean like a window of time. We mean like a window, like a teller window or like a desk, basically. So it's a facility that lends short term uh, by the Federal Reserve to banks or to financial institutions. So what we talked about last week was interesting. So this dotted line represents the rate at which they were borrowing. And then these gray lines are the three and six month treasury yields. So the fact that these yields were higher than what the Fed was lending and the Fed was basically taking everyone's low yielding long term debt as collateral, giving them par value uh, for a 90 day loan meant that that institutions could just like get free money. They, they could put those bonds with the Fed, get money at a hot, you know, at this interest rate here and then turn around and buy a short term bond yielding at a higher rate. And that's just like that's pure profit for them. So one thing that the uh, raising the interest rate by 25 basis points did. Uh, was take this dotted line and move it up. So now for this past week, um, for the most part, uh, they haven't been able to do kind of the same thing. A little bit right here, but that's so small that that really might not be much um, much yield to be had. So that was that was kind of an important thing that happened in terms of like the nuance of yields. Um, now I'm definitely not an expert on this, so it's it's possible that I could be missing something. Maybe there's some other factors or some other fees that banks have to pay that that sort of would hypothetically take this dotted line and you know maybe move it higher. But just from the plain look at it, to me, it looks like um, that was basically free money. And then most of that has ended now. And those are 90 day loans. So we should expect those to get paid back here. The other thing that was interesting over the past couple of weeks, um, this pink line is the yield curve inversion. So uh, we've talked about this a number of times before. And the concern is, is when the yield curve inversion corrects back to normal, um, like it did here in 2008. And then it did the same thing back in 2001 uh, right here. So what we've seen is a big spike back to i mean it's still inverted overall it's still inverted but it's a lot closer to being not inverted now so um that's that's concerning we'll, we'll have to watch that uh usually this is delayed by at least a few months so um and the other thing too is like this could come right back down but if it goes back into normal territory and then continues to go up yeah it could, that could be a dicey sign you might want to you might want to um, think about getting out of the markets or at least hedging your position um so that's like to me, that was the big news um, this week that happened. Uh, and then kind of the other big news um, as of today, last night, is Monero has started to pump, going back to the top of its uh, its bear market resistance line. Yeah, so uh... our lovely stable coin, Monero, go to the must short term. Been, uh, must have been our gate.io spaces last night that really pumped the price. <laughs> <laughs> that was it. Definitely was that. Right. Actually, you know, I, I was listening to um, to one of your uh, the the podcast with the Christian, the interview with, with uh, I can't remember his name. I feel bad. I think we were friends on Twitter. Nick. Nick. I was listening to uh, Nick and the advertisement um, that you guys put um, for I can't remember which exchange it was tro trocador.app. Um, I was really impressed because uh, their rates are lower than basically everyone else. And then they list everyone else's rates uh, for swapping when you're on their on their website. So I thought that was kind of cool. Yeah, I wasn't able to access them from Tor, but uh, you know, VPN was I could. Oh, I thought they even have like a Dot Onion site, don't they? Oh, really? Maybe I need to look to look because I didn't I didn't go to the Dot Onion version. I just went to oh, the um, I think they do. Yeah, you know, yeah. Dot app. All right. Well, that's good. They're, to know. they're, they're for... cool guys. Yeah, I think are they going to be down in the Neurotopia? I, I think, think so. Right? Yeah, I yeah. believe they are. They're part part of our just... adoption alley, but yeah. Uh, yeah, I think they'll be down there actually. I think, yeah. Yeah, very, he's a very nice guy. Cool. Well, I look forward to uh, to chatting with him then. Yeah. All right. So here we got Monero. Like I said, uh, we're, we're up to going to the top of this line. Remember, we were down here. We said if you're a trader, this is probably a pretty good bet. Um, and if you're a trader, you might you might start questioning whether you want to maybe take some profits right here on Monero. Um, we have other interesting things happening. So 
Uh, Bitfinex, which who knows if they're telling you the truth or not, but we have a whole bunch of Monero longs that just got opened um, as of Monday. So that's another interesting thing. Uh, our ratio is finally pushing back to 0 0.006 uh, versus Bitcoin. So um, I'm not really, I'm not really sure what to make of this. Again, if there's broad positive action in crypto markets and stocks, then um, I really just have to think that we're we're probably going to spend time uh, down in this area here. So uh, just something to be prepared for. And then one thing that's really puzzling me right now is the um, is the price divergences. So. Basically, remember we talked about uh, last week that Binance just really pumped their prices up here. Uh, this was like a 1% divergence, and then they did a lot of volume. And then, um, again, there's this positive price divergence with, with volume. Um, and Monero has gone up a little bit, but not nearly as much as you would expect given this price divergence. So I'm not really sure what to make of that. I do, I do wonder if... Um, so I made this script public. I do wonder if these guys pay attention to that kind of thing at all? Um, are they kind of like screwing with their numbers now so that they can, uh, you know, so that it, there's no signal here for people that are trading Monero so that they can't use this as a signal potentially like, uh, or, you know, may, maybe not, maybe they're up to something else. I, I don't know, but I, I really can't, I really don't know what to make of this because in the past it's, it has been fairly useful to be able to see, um, to get some idea of where Monero's price might be going. Um, so the broader markets are basically, positive. Um, but uh, we had a kind of a, the, the day ended on a big dip here. So, I mean, everything is still uh, like, this is a uh, Bitcoin, for example, everything is still kind of trending here at this top line. Um, that doesn't mean that, you know, we couldn't come down to this line right here. Uh, for the moment, the markets seem broadly positive. Um, the S&P has bigger problems than the NASDAQ, because again, the banks um, are all sort of, not all of them, but, you know, banks are going to be as part of the S&P, not the NASDAQ. Um, and since banks have been having problems, uh, you know, they've, they've kind of had a little bit more trouble here getting establishing support as uh, or establishing this bear market trend line as support. Uh, however, the Nasdaq has already gotten back up to um, to uh, the original place where it kind of pumped out of um, in in January. So it's already back up here at the top. That, that looks I mean, that looks good. That looks positive. Um, there is like, I, I do feel like just intuitively that there's some uncertainty in the markets right now, which is probably why Bitcoin sold off uh, and why crypto sold off here at the end of the day. It's like, it's kind of hard if you're not already long to get long right here. Cause you look at this and you think, well, you know, we're at the top of the trend and uh, this has now been like, uh, at least a week of action. And it's like, we can't quite break this line. So, um, and then we've kind of got other, other places that are going to be, um, somewhat limiting. Uh, let's turn the statistics off for a moment. Uh, so, I mean, obviously, the the, the July, uh, or sorry, the summer of 2021, um, this area is going to be um, somewhat, definitely going to be somewhat limiting. And then, of course, back in 2022 for the summer, this area right here. So we're, we're basically coming up, or at least Bitcoin is coming up on this place where you would think that this is going to be a, a tough place to rise above. So if we've got general positivity in the rest of the markets, maybe this can just happen. Maybe it can just pump. But um, it does it does look like the market might be just a little bit uncertain right here. So um, really, I, I don't feel like I have a good read on the markets right now. So uh, I wouldn't be able to recommend anything necessarily uh, specific to do. The dollar index, uh, another, you know, another big one that we keep track of here. Uh, the, it was kind of schizophrenic around the, the banking problems. And then I was kind of expecting like this bounce. It, it wasn't entirely surprising, but I really did think that we would come to this long trend line right here because uh, if we take a look at the, the longer timeline, you can see that this trend line is, is like decades long. Yeah, so so this trend line, uh, you kind of expected that we were going to hit that back here. So maybe that's what's going to happen now. I did expect the dollar to make it all the way up to that splitter, and that didn't happen either. So uh, I do think that uh, sort of the fundamental events that happened with the banking sector, you know, that, that could be part of it. So, uh, I mean, overall, I, I still see sort of continuation here. I don't see big signs that this is on the verge of reversal, that we're suddenly going to crash again. But there are little signs creeping up. Um, there's a couple other things that, that I've started to put on my horizon here or on my, on my list. Um, so we'll, we'll talk about those a little bit later some other time if, uh, if they become a problem. Right now, it's like just the beginning of a blip. But that blip, if it continues in the direction that it did, uh, that, would, that would become a problem eventually. So I guess that's about all I have for you guys today. There's really, there's really not too much to talk about. The markets are overall flat to positive. 
uh, and there is uncertainty. So traders, you know, try not to be too G D gens. Good luck. All right, man. Awesome. What's uh Oh, Gary Gary Johnson. Someone Gary. in the comments yeah, here yeah, put Gary Johnson. That's that's what we're talking about. That was okay, Gary Johnson. How is how is the BTC XMR looking? What do you like what, what's your what's your call on that? Uh so we've got um this was the Monero Bitcoin price chart. So uh, I, I do think that this support right here, these up up uh up sloping lines, excuse me. Uh, I do think that should be good support overall. It's been support for a very long time. It's it's amazing actually how this structure and this structure were just so similar. And of course, we hope that that would happen. You know that this thing would pump, and it's really not what happened. Um, okay. But I mean, thoughts on on XMR BTC? We're we're not looking super rosy. It's it's kind of like a hedge in a way. So if things are not looking good with the markets and we're going into a bear market, XMR BTC should perform. Uh, when the leverage has to unwind on these propped up prices, including Bitcoin, um, the, the leverage has to unwind and Monero does relatively better. And, and then, of course, uh, because there's actually it's actually used in, in certain markets. Uh, but when things are positive, and the market's bouncing. It's like, well, you know, they're they're leveraging up the price. So it's, it's kind of like we have to deal with uh, we have to deal with this crap right here. So my thinking on XMR BTC is not to hope for too much at the moment. I think that it's very possible we're going to play in this range, maybe at some point come down here uh, before maybe maybe coming up to the top of the range. And what's interesting is that this structure right here would even it would even resonate or, or corroborate the idea that I have that later this year, uh, maybe it's August, maybe it's November, uh, that we're going to have another return to the downside for the markets in general. Like maybe it'll be a double bottom or maybe it'll be like an actual full full blown crisis. I think for now. Like, I don't think that this whole banking thing is going to turn into a big contagion crisis. Like, I do think that this is very likely to just kind of sort of go away and, and become less prominent, less of a big deal. But but I do think that there are the signs that we probably have to contend with the lows or somewhere close to it. Bitcoin 20K, 19K, S&P, NASDAQ, somewhere close to their lows again later this year. So somewhere around this time frame, which, uh, again, if we're talking about... Um, just in terms of XMR BTC, and, and I, I don't want to, I don't want to sound like I'm trying to take this too far because it's really easy to extrapolate and be like, oh, well, I know the answer because XMR BTC just says this. It's just like a little data point you put in your head. We know that the ratio performs during bear markets um, when when things are questionable, and we do know that we're looking at this kind of um, this TA signature right here, or pattern or whatever that we've seen before, where like, okay, if Bitcoin and the markets are going to do good. We're probably going to be doing something like that before potentially beating this area again, which notice that lines up September, November, right at the end of the year here. So that's that's just a very small point. That's like, OK, that would be a small corroborating point. And then you try and collect these overall. That's the idea. You, you don't want to like be like, this is the thing, right? That's you're, you're dealing with probabilities here. So hopefully that that makes some sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it would be cool if we saw a, like a little bit of a move to Monero out of kind of what the, like the zeitgeist right now. What's going on in crypto, right? You got the guy Balage, right? Who's <laughs> screaming fire in the building and, you know, uh, fiat is done. The only safe spot is Bitcoin. And not only that, they're going to come after your Bitcoin, right? He's, he's like just trying to, he's amping it up even more and more, right? He's like, so ridiculous. Uh, These guys is are not, like, dude. move it up, move it all to Bitcoin and, don't be surprised if the government like knocks on your door and they try to they try to take your Bitcoin away from you. And, uh, you know, and, and people listen to that crap. People believe that crap. They hear it like they, they just they're playing on on the plebs emotions. They're playing on retail. They're, they're like they're pulling all the puppet strings. It's it's designed to get people on the wrong he's side of the market. Just, he's just doing a pump. I mean, he's just he's just I doing do think I do think that we're kind of like so if you remember uh, maybe a couple months ago when we talked about. Uh, or just in general, kind of, I've talked about um, you. You have these market makers, exchanges, these influencers, the big players, yada yada. Um, it can be sometimes that they need retail on the opposite side of the trade. Like for example, in 2021, they needed exit liquidity at the top, so everything was just like unrelentingly positive. It was just like, right, yeah, right. it's going 100k. And then recently, that was actually a big tell for me in in January. Some of these big players, even CZ, um, were giving 
little clues and indicators that the market had farther down to go. And all of my charts, as we talked about, everything was shifting towards the other side, towards the positive. And then when those guys were like, oh, be scared and sell, I was like, no, this is, they're, they're getting entrance liquidity. Now they're reacquiring their backs. So sorry to answer your question a very long way here, but to answer your question right now, they need people to augment their long trade. They're in the long trade, they're on the long side of the market and they want more retail, more plebs to be fearful of hyperinflation, to get into Bitcoin, to buy crypto, pump their bags. And at some point they're gonna be looking for exit liquidity. Now, I'm not sure that they know exactly how long, how much positivity retail can have, but at some point, these guys are going to start selling their bags. They're going to try and get volume buying, but they're, they're going to sell their bags um, into the volume retail buying. And that's just how the game is played. That's just what they do. So um, I mean, you, you can't like... Sorry, go ahead. isn't going to hodl all the way to a million. <laughs> well, he's probably got a big hodl that he's never going to sell, um, but he's got a, you, you can bet he's got a trading stack and he's got other economic interests involved yeah. with um, like playing the market. Yeah. But, but I guess the point I wanted to make though, right? So like, if you're going to continue down his road, the logic he's using, uh, you might want to move some of that into Monero, right? If you're, if you're worried that, you know, absolutely the unconfiscatability nature of crypto is about to be tested, you might want to move it into Monero. Yeah, yeah. So buy some I, I, Monero, some it, it would be it would be amazing if we started to see that play out. Um, obviously, that'd be amazing. Do if, you think if the, you, if the government took everyone's Bitcoin? <laughs> no, it'd be amazing if we saw that that play out in the market. Oh yeah, I got you. Were, gotcha. Like thinking this is going to happen, and you know they're trying to move to a safe haven, and they they do the next level of thinking. Big, like, wait a minute. You could see you could see all my Bitcoin. They could see where I bought it. They know I still have it. Maybe I want to throw it in a, in a safer space, which is Monero, right? Monero is a safe space. <laughs> <laughs> the Monero Topia is a safe space. Um, sure. yeah, man. So I don't know. I, is that is that uh, is that too? Am I dreaming? Is that that's not? That's um, not I'm soon. You you might be daydreaming. It it could it could happen. Um, I just let, let me ask you this: Do you think? Any of the movement we've seen with Bitcoin, like its recent run up, had anything to do with these uh, concepts that are out there, like that it is the same oh, yeah. and fiat is dying? Or was it really just that the market was anticipating that the interest rates were, you know, the pivot was going to happen? No, it was definitely organic purchasing. People really were afraid the system might collapse. They really were fear, afraid of banking contagion. There was definitely organic moves into Bitcoin, um, so and and of course that gets supplemented with leverage as well. Right. So, what, what do you think most of the pump was coming from? Was it coming from the lower, the anticipating that the you know it's the end of interest rate raising, or this you know fiat is dying and you better get your Bitcoin now? Like, oh, we, um, I would I would go with the uh, with the interest rates and. Yeah, that's and what I'm saying, right? Like, I the feel the availability like that... of, yeah, yeah, the availability of cap uh, capital. Like, those are the things that really drive the big players that can move the markets and and smart money as well. I mean, they're not not everyone is in a back smoky room and all, but um, you know, the people that have access to liquidity, big liquidity to move a trillion dollar market cap, uh, when they when the rates are more friendly to them and when there's um, these programs at the Fed where they can they can loan money or, or uh, borrow money. Like, yeah, that that's the thing that's really driving the market. The narrative is just there to, like, kind of convince the retail guys as well. Right. All right, man. Good stuff. We'll see. Well, thank you very much. How mm -hmm. the story pans out next week. Yeah. Everybody Hopefully, rushes into Monero. I'm going to see Monero break that <laughs> overhead resistance. Yeah, that's right. You know what? Why don't we, let's just, we should start putting out our own narratives. Doesn't matter. True or not. <laughs> Monero the way narratives. That's the way the narratives. Goes. I mean, it's a, it's a legitimate narrative, right? If, if people are going to start moving over away from fiat into Bitcoin because they're worried that the fiat system is collapsing. And if the next thought is they're worried that their crypto is going to be confiscated, it makes sense. Yeah, it does. The only thing I worry about new retail plebs is like they only know what guys like Balaji tell them. And Balaji is not going to tell them to go buy Monero. Like the people that have been in it, for, in it for a while, the ones that have principles, the real libertarians, those guys, we already know about Monero. And um, 
you know, we have our brethren on the Bitcoin side as well that believe in the same principles and some of them kind of hate Monero, but the new guys, it's like, I, I don't know, like something needs to happen to reach them. And it's very difficult because I do think that it's likely that some of these powerful forces actually try to make sure Monero does not get out to the masses. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I mean, I think maybe at one point, though, you will have your your Michael Saylor or Balazs of, uh, of Monero. I think you're let's gonna... do a CSS collage <laughs> promotion. We just need somebody to pretend to be the, be that person. Yeah, maybe you know if unknown CSS, we'll, we'll, we'll hack someone's Twitter account and, <laughs> and you know, just for a moment. Yeah, we'll use we'll borrow. We'll borrow their account. All right, buddy. All right, man. Stuff. Thank you. Alrighty. Talk to you next week. Cheers. All right. See ya. Bye bye.